Good morning, and welcome to the Global Missions Sunday of the Anglican Church in North America. Many of you know that we are part of the Anglican Church in North America, um, but some of you aren't necessarily quite as familiar with the Global Anglican Communion. The Global Anglican Communion consists of about 85 million people. It's the largest Protestant denomination in the world. Now, some of you know that this movement, this communion became so large in part because the sun never set on the British Empire and wherever the British Empire went, so went her church. And there were substantial complications with that, of which the Anglican church has repented and needs to continue to repent. However, what also occurred was there was a global missional movement that was sparked by the Anglican communion. In fact, historically, Anglicans have always been on the forefront of global missions. And it's interesting. Today in the Anglican church, the primary leadership is not in the West. It is not people that look like me. Rather, it is the place, the very places where missionaries had gone oh, a few hundred years ago. Now places like Southeast Asia, Africa, Central and South America are leading the global Anglican church. Today, we are living with the fruit and the blessing of a lifestyle of global mission. And in fact, those who at one time were reached through global evangelism are now coming back to re-evangelize the West. Now, it's important that, you know, I think we need to name something. And as a church, we've been praying about this and thinking about this for some time. For the past few decades, uh, we have recaptured a vision of local mission. We talk so much about reaching our neighbors, uh, about doing works of justice and mercy in our city and in our nation. Uh, this is why we plant churches. This is why we work with refugees. This is why we partner with Synergy Village. We care about the people in our own backyard. But my concern is that we have lost a gaze out on the horizon for global mission. In our eagerness to remember that we are called to be missionaries in our own city, maybe we have lost sight of the fact that there are still people that have not been reached with the gospel. And so as a church, we've begun to, to partner with missionaries all over the world, and we're going to talk about them later, whether that's in India or, or Laos or, or Lithuania, to reach people at the furthest ends of the earth, because that's where the gospel is called to go. Today is Global Mission Sunday, and it's rather fitting that in our sermon series through Isaiah 40, we've actually come upon verses 15 through 17, something I didn't plan, but often happens in sermon series. God knew what he was doing when he planned it where we're going to look at this passage about the nations and how they're like a drop in the bucket compared to God. And so I want to look at three things today. We're going to jump off from this passage. If you can't tell, I woke up. I'm not going to preside. I'm not going to hand out the Eucharist because I, I woke up under the weather. So I'm going to stay away from all of you all. So pray that this, you can at least understand halfway what's going on in today's sermon. But don't worry, Kyle's doing everything else except for the preaching part. Um, we're going to look at three things today. First, what stands in the way of global mission? What happens in our hearts and in our minds and in our actions that, that halts us from engaging global mission? Second, uh, we're going to look at what is the scope and end of global mission? Who is meant to be involved in missions? And what is the end? What's the purpose? And third, what is God's method for global missions? What method does he use to reach the world? So if you would, turn with me to Isaiah 40, verses 15 through 17. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust of the scale, on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. In my experience, when we think about the state of the world, and when we think about unreached people, we are tempted to despair. We have a number of stories that run in our minds. You know, how could we, sending a missionary and, and, 
and pouring time and resources into sending this person out be anything more than a raindrop in the ocean of alienation from God? Is it even going to do anything? We look at countries that are closed, and it's dangerous to send people there, and it's dangerous to actually make converts there. And we ask, should we even be sending these people over to die? Or the people that they convert, is it even right to convert them? Because they're going to die too. We look at the parable of the rocky soil and we ask, should we invest our resources in difficult places? Like, Why would we send a, a, a missionary to Paris or something, right? Why would we do that when there's much more fertile ground somewhere else? In my experience, we often have a number of stories that run through our minds that are, are these places that we trip up on when we think about missions. We have all of these reasons why we shouldn't engage it or why if we do, it's not going to work out anyway. But I think these all can basically be boiled down to a simple belief that God isn't as powerful as we think he is. All of the reasons that we give for why we shouldn't send a missionary here or why this task over here is impossible. Why would we ever do that? It's because we've lost sight of the overwhelming power and capacity of our God. And this is actually what our passage is about today in Isaiah 40. If you remember, we're, we're in the Babylonian captivity. Israel is captive under the Babylonians. The northern kingdom has been uh, conquered by the Assyrians. Later, we're going to see that the Egyptians are knocking at the door and they try to make an alliance with them. And the Egyptians are always a threat. But what do each of the nations represent? What do they represent to the people of Israel? Power. They represent those that you cannot beat. They represent those that in your own strength, there is no way you can stand against them. They are more culturally refined than Israel. They're the places of art and poetry and literature. They're more wealthy than Israel, especially Egypt, where you have like, you know, this, this fertile land all throughout the Nile. They have more money than they know what to do with. They're, they're more, they have higher military capacity. That if they sneeze, Israel is going to be conquered. The only way that Israel ever stands a chance against the Babylonians, the Assyrians, or the Egyptians is if they're waging a much more important war somewhere else. And then they're kind of like, oh, yeah, we've got to do that whole Israel thing. Kind of send one garrison over there. We'll, we'll kind of work it out. That's the only chance they have. If they muster all of their power and all their strength, it's not even a fight. And yet in that situation, what does God say? Behold. The nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before me. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. Now, in the second part of the sermon, we're going to look at you shouldn't read that as God saying, these are unimportant to me. It's not that the nations are unimportant to God. He's not trying to say they're nothing to me and therefore I'm going to skip over them. He's not saying that at all. We're going to see that later. Rather, what he's saying is their power, you shouldn't be afraid of it. You shouldn't see it as a rival to what I can do. And so often in missions, why we don't boldly send why we don't boldly go, why we don't boldly resource missionaries is because deep in the back of our minds is this thought, it's going to fail anyway. And in those moments, we need to read Isaiah 40. In those moments, we need to remember that it does, that our God is greater than all of the worldly powers that surround us that look so great that our God could conquer your wandering heart. And therefore, our God can reach the furthest tribe in the, in the area that you've never even heard of with the gospel of redemption in his name. That is where global mission has to begin, a confident boldness 
that our God is powerful enough to accomplish his mission in the world. I was talking to a Muslim friend of mine a few years ago, and he's incredibly curious about Christianity for all the right reasons. But you know the one that, you don't know the reason why he has become curious about the faith? He said, well, one, he said, everything I was ever told about you was a lie, so why are they lying to me so much? But the second one was this, why do we have to threaten to kill people to make them Muslims? And they are willing to die to become Christians. Why do we have to threaten them with death and yet they're willing to die to follow Jesus? And I, we're, we're friends, so I can speak clearly and boldly. And all I could say was, because we have the power of God and you don't. And as long as we forget that God is powerful over the nations, powerful over the human heart, we will be meek and timid in mission. You know, I know some of you work for large technology companies, and they are the epitome of power today. And you've told me, I cannot actively be a Christian in my place of work. I can't, it's the, the cultural trends are just too firm. They're, they're too strong. Do you believe that the Lord towers even over our technological wealth today? Do you believe that? And that he can even work in your office or Zoom. We don't have offices anymore, but you know what I mean. Some of you have families that are antagonistic to the Christian faith or have bought into an understanding of Christianity that's really more about politics than it is about a saving faith in Jesus. Do you believe that even Christ, Christ Jesus can even tower over your family and bring hard hearts into saving faith? I know some of you, you see our refugee ministry that we have, and we have Venezuelan families, and we have um, families from Afghanistan and Iraq, and you think, I, I don't know, the cultural gap's too big. I, I don't know. It, it just seems like it would be a huge amount of energy and nothing would come of it. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is, even has authority over that relationship and can, and can bring fruit from it? I think about our city of Littleton and our radical decadence and our fractionalization of, um, you know, we, we have no locality about us anymore, right? Because we're always traveling or going to the mountains or, or engaging in just uh, the, the incredible hedonism of our city, especially the hedonism that we don't consider hedonism. And you wonder, would anyone ever accept a Lord over their life in our city? When the whole reality is, I don't need a Lord. I am my own Lord. Do I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ can even take the untamed heart of a little Tonian? Is that what you say? Someone from Littleton. And soften it to his reign and bring them into life. Whether we are looking out on the horizon of mission, at those that are far off and unreached, or the people in our backyard, it begins with the conviction that the Lord towers over the nations. But he does not tower over them in wrath. Rather, he stands over them in authority and compassion and love. As I said, it would be a misreading of this text to then read that God doesn't care about the nations. But what we see from the very beginning of the Holy Scriptures, when God first calls forth the people with Abraham, they are blessed for what purpose? To reach the nations. One of my favorite uh, biblical scholars, G.K. Beale, um, he's, he's my favorite biblical. I'll just say he's my favorite. He talks about that actually the garden was meant to expand. God's mission has always been expansive. And that expansion has always been through God's people. But we see that Abraham in Genesis chapter 1, what do we see? When God makes a covenant with him, there's a purpose towards it. It's to reach the nations. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. So you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. What is the scope of God's mission on this earth? It's everyone. 
The scope of God's mission is to bring his people out into the world, to send them out into the world to be a blessing to the nations. Because what do we know from Romans chapter four? The descendants of Abraham are who? The faithful us. This is a promise and a commandment given to us to be a blessing to all families of the earth. And we see this continued in the New Testament. I'm going to read a few passages today. 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6 says this, This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Who fits into the mission of God? All people. 1 Peter 3, 8 through 10 says this, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works of that are done on it will be exposed. What do we see here? We also see the patience of God to reach the world. So often, what do we think? There's not enough time. There's not enough time to reach people. And so we write them off. It's just going to be a drop in the bucket, so why send missionaries over there? There's not enough time to reach them, and yet what does God say? Don't look at your sense of time. Look at my sense of time. We need that actually in our own personal lives too, right? Because what do we think? That person's time is up. I've given them enough. You know, I've tried to evangelize them over and over again. Nothing has happened. I need to move on, right? But what does the Lord say? I am patient. How dare we not be patient? He doesn't write people off. How could we write someone off? And then what we see is the end. Here's the scope, right? It's, it's a long period of time with all people, but here's the end towards which it's directed that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Christ Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is not qualified that only the faithful will bow their knees and confess the name of Jesus. It is everyone. And either that day will come upon you as a celebration, as an announcement of the end towards which your life has been directed, that that is the continuation of the song that you have always been singing, or it will come upon you as a terror. Or it will, your knees will be forced to bend and your tongue will be forced to confess. And so what we see here is that at some point, everyone is going to recognize that Jesus Christ is Lord. The question is, is that a day of joy and singing, or is that a day of sorrow and gnashing of teeth? In fact, I think this image is, continues in Revelation 7, verses 9 through 12, where we see the joy, the hope of seeing the presence of our Lord. Look at Revelation 7. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. What we see here is that Palm Sunday will continue on forever. And it will be all nations and all peoples. But it's interesting. If you actually look at the continuation of this context, it's the people that have survived through the tribulation. Now, 
we're, we're Anglicans, so we believe that the tribulation is the entire life of the church. The whole life of the church has been the tribulation. But there are specifically Christians who have gone through unique and terrible tribulations. Those whose hands have been broken for Christ Jesus. And the promise is given, you will have a palm branch to wave. Those whose clothes have been coated in blood. And Jesus says, my blood will wash you as white as snow. There are those in the world who have paid a profound cost to follow Christ Jesus. And we see that the end of evangelism is to stand in the presence of our Lord forever. I've shared this with you before, and I, I don't want to diminish the importance of our work here on earth. I don't. But for years now, it feels like we have said, you know, Christianity isn't about you getting saved and exiting the world. That's not what it's about. And I think that's a very bourgeois perspective, to be frank. Um, there are many in the world that are like, that's precisely what I want. I live in a world in which my life is perpetual persecution for the Lord, where I am hated by those around me for Jesus. And the hope that they have is that suffering will not last forever. Only a Christianity that doesn't suffer says that the redemption of all things is a, is a footnote. And sadly, many of our academics and people with pens and voices have not suffered nearly enough. The word that we are given in the Holy Scripture is that we are called to be a people of evangelism, a people of mission, a people of inviting those that are lost into salvation in Christ Jesus so that they can enter into an eternal life with him. And yes, that changes your life today. Yes, we are called to be a people who love the most marginalized. We care for the widow. We care for the orphan. We, we care about healing across economic and racial and social lines. We care about all of those things. But we care about those that are going to spend eternity away from our Lord. And we invite them into new life in him. How could we ever lose sight of that? How could we ever lose sight of that first calling of our faith? To be a people of mission, a people who care about those that do not know the Lord and seek to bring them into saving faith in him. Now, this brings me to that very last point, the method. What method does God use to go about mission? He uses the most dumb method I can imagine, his people. If I were God, I would make a grand spectacle that no one would deny. If I were God, I would say, shebang, and you know, every knee will bow, every tongue confess, because you can't deny it. But he does something different. Rather, he sends out his people to woo the hearts of the lost, to bear testimony about how Christ has saved them and how Christ will save them as well. Look at Matthew 28. This passage, we all know it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, what has God's plan been for mission? It has always been through his people, whether that's Abraham or the Israelites. So often we view the Israelites' um, isolationism as prescriptive. So I guess the church should be this isolated holy community. That's never prescriptive. It's only descriptive of what Israel has done. It's actually always a mark of their disobedience, not their obedience. They've always been meant to be a light to the nations, not hate them. But what does Israel always tempted to do? To just hate the nations. That was never God's plan. It's never the plan for the church to hate the nations. It's always his plan to reach them. But, you know, I talked about this a few weeks ago. What message do we bear? We bear the message of John the Baptist. We are a people who don't point at ourselves at the end of the day. We're a people who point to one that stands above us and yet within us. The king who rules over us and yet walks alongside us as our shepherd. We're a people who always point to Jesus Christ. 
We are a people who fundamentally bear testimony. And that testimony is simple. God has saved me and he will save you. I think we make that way too complicated, right? We only ever point at ourselves in order to always point at someone outside of ourselves. Christ Jesus has saved me and he will save you. In fact, we see this very message in Isaiah 43, just three chapters later. What, is, what are the people called to do with the nations? They're called to bear witness to the saving work of God. Isaiah 43, 8 through 13 says, Bring out the people who are blind yet have eyes, who are deaf yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say it is true. You are my witness, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth, I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? What is the call of the church? It's simply to bear witness to bear witness to the one who saved us. Yes, we are called to have nuanced and careful answers for all of the world's complicated questions, right? But in my experience, often, you know, people do have questions, especially in our city, you know, they have questions and we should have thoughtful answers and we do have thoughtful answers uh, for the world's questions. But at the end of the day, <laughs> testimony of Christ's saving work is far more powerful than any philosophical answer we can give. Not saying philosophical answers are not important. You all know, I study philosophy. I love that stuff. It's my thing. But testimony reaches the heart. Testimony that says, Christ Jesus carried me through my greatest sorrow, and he can carry you through yours. Testimony that says, Christ Jesus removed my sins away from me so that I don't live in perpetual guilt. And he can give that same gift to you. Testimony that says, we can learn the power of forgiveness through being forgiven by Christ Jesus. Because guys, in our world today, that's the thing I think people are going to be longing for pretty soon is forgiveness because we're increasingly closing the capacity to feel forgiven. Whatever it might be, what we have is actually this great gift of Christ Jesus. The gift of Christ Jesus that has actually transformed our lives. And the call of the church is to send out people all throughout the world with the greatest news that can ever be proclaimed. Christ Jesus saved me and he can save you. What stands in the way of mission? It's our small view of God. Family, we need a grand view of God that towers over the nations, and that creates boldness to send out missionaries wherever they are called to go. What is the scope and end of God's mission? It is the entire earth to bring them into a life of worshiping him forever. And what is his method? It's people like you and me proclaiming to the world, Christ Jesus has saved me and he'll save you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of mission. You are the God who has gone out into the world in your very presence in Christ Jesus to bring us into life. And you promise that you tower over this world. Lord, would you give us boldness? Lord, would you remove the fear in our hearts? L Lord, would, would we know that you are with us wherever we go. Lord, we pray for missionaries that are in the darkest places on this earth. Lord, would your spirit strengthen them and give them a powerful testimony of salvation in you. Lord, would you give them boldness and comfort knowing that they are never alone for you are always with them. And Lord, would you keep them near to our hearts to the glory of your name. Amen.